All right, Phil, you're getting out of the Navy and you wind up with the New York Giants. What kept you kind of driven to try a pro career? Well, I thought I was going to be a Navy pilot for 20 years. Um, I got done playing at the academy and we went to a bowl game. I was MVP of the bowl game and it was a pretty nice way to end your football career as a 21, 22 year old. And I thought that was it. I was looking at five years in the Navy and didn't think there was any way I'd have a chance to play pro football. About three, three and a half years into my commitment and I was enjoying the Navy and flying, I just started getting this, this urge to play football again. And I kept wondering what would happen if I had the opportunity. And I'd watch games on Sunday and at some point along the way during that time, I said to myself, this was my dream as a little boy. I'm gonna get out of the Navy when my time is up, I'm gonna try it. So 27 years old, barely 160 pounds and I hadn't played football in five years. And I told people I was gonna play pro football or try to play. They laughed at me. They said it was just an impossible dream. You couldn't do it. So first thing I did, I was at the Naval Academy. I sought out Steve Belichick, Bill's father, who had been an assistant there for many, many years. And I said, you know, what do you think? He goes, well, you've got to run under 4'6 or nobody will even talk to you. So he says, come on out tomorrow, I'll time you. So he timed me and he goes, do it again. He timed me again. He goes, both in the four fours. He goes, I'll call Bill. I mean, Belichick, and that was the first year Bill Belichick became defensive coordinator from special teams coach. As you know, Parcells went from defensive coordinator to head coach, and that's how I got my shot and I got a look. You're 27, um, and you're going to a football team that's starting to build something. What was it like, and what did you think your chances really were? Well, you know, I, I sit and I look back, and really I didn't have a very good chance at all. For some reason, I thought I could do it. I thought I was good enough. I thought that if given the chance, uh, I could make it. I could overcome all these hurdles and obstacles. And I just remember going full speed, all out on every single snap, because thinking this was going to be the last. You know, maybe I, I, I don't last. And I'll never forget Bill Parcells' first practice as a head coach. He came up to me after that practice and he said to me, son, you better slow your motor down. You're going to burn yourself out. I don't know if he's ever done that in his career, told somebody to slow it down. But for some reason, I fought and scratched and clawed and thought I could do it. Were you worried about having not played football for as long as you had that you could be fast, you could buzz around, but there's a physical component that you can never prepare for until you actually get hit. Yeah, I think there was some rust there and I realized it. And, and every day I got more and more comfortable. And I think the change of the coaching staff and Parcells coming as head coach and Belichick and Romeo Cornell and those guys and Pat Hodgson, um, you know, you felt like there was a, a real opportunity. The big thing for me was my ability to catch punts. If you remember, those two guys leading this team were both defensive-minded coaches. The last thing in the world they want is some little SOB going on the field and dropping the ball, watching their defense go back out onto the field. And I think that pressure and that being uncomfortable kind of really honed my focus. I mean, catching punts in Giant Stadium was a tough chore. I mean, that wind would howl. It was tough enough with under ideal situations, but you add the inclement weather and the winds, it was really difficult to catch punts. And I think that helped me focus. So I think my ability to catch punts and securely catch punts really caught their eye early on. And that gave me, just got my foot in the door. In 1985, Phil McConkey would have his best season with the New York Giants, becoming a reliable target for quarterback Phil Sims. McConkey would have career highs in receptions and punt return yardage. 85 came and, you know, again, we made the playoffs in 84 and 85, playing special teams, punt returners, returning kickoffs, and then getting my shot as a receiver, mostly on third down, and then shuttling in play. So probably that year I got to play as much as any. And I thought at that point, after two years, that, that my skills were starting to hone themselves and the rust was starting to come off and that I was getting better. Even though I was getting into my late 20s, which for a wide receiver or for an NFL player is pretty ancient. All right, so you come to the team in 84, playoffs, lose to the Niners. 85, you lose to the Chicago Bears, two teams that went on and win in the Super Bowl. When you stepped off the field in 85, did you say, you know, we've got what's under the hood of this car to take this thing to the next level? Yeah, I think everybody did. Uh, we. I, the painful part was you lose a game like that and you know you've got to go through the whole process again. There's a whole nother year and mini camp and training camp and all the pain of a regular season schedule and just, you know, minutes before you were in the, the exact spot you wanted to be in and you had to go through it all over again. So I think that that experience really galvanized this team. Losing that game 
was the impetus for the giant players and organization to go on to win the Super Bowl. Despite his most productive season as a giant in 1985, McConkie was surprised to find out that his time with the Big Blue would have a premature ending. I come to training camp and I thought I had the best training camp of the three. I thought my skills had kind of come back and I, I was mature, I knew exactly what I was doing. Thought I had a great training camp. So it was a bit of a shock to me when I got cut. And um, Parcells called me in and said, you know, McConkie, if I didn't have your name on your jersey, I wouldn't have known it was you. And I'm going, and I remember thinking to myself, well, what are you talking about? This is the best training camp I've ever had. You're just looking for excuses, Bill. Um, so I get cut, it was devastating. Um, still thought I could play pro football and got a call a few hours later from the Green Bay Packers to go to Green Bay. Fly into Green Bay, all excited. I'm playing for this legendary franchise. And I remember driving up to Lambeau Field to go to the locker room, sign a contract. And outside the stadium, there was a Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame. And at that time, they had a Green Bay Packers statue, bigger than life, number 88 on the jersey. Um, I get into the stadium, uh, they give me a jersey and they're num number 88. So I go to practice, sign the contract. Afterwards, I'm at the locker and the reporters are all coming around, you know, new guy in town, and they say, well, what do you think of it so far? I go, man, this place is unbelievable. Go, what are you talking about? I go, well, can you imagine getting cut by a team and then getting picked up by waivers by the Packers and they erect a statue of you in front of the museum before you even play it down and they look down at my number 88 and they got a, they got a chuckle, so <laughs> it was fun. But after just four games into his stint with Green Bay, Phil would find out that he was once again on the move. Monday after the fourth loss with the Packers and I get called in to see the head coach. Forrest Gregg was the head coach. So I think, you know what? We got a guy coming back from injured reserve. Maybe I'm gonna be gone. And he sits me down in a chair. He goes, I've got some good news for you. We've traded you back to the Giants. And I just looked at him like, like he was from outer space. It didn't make any sense to me at the time. You know, I just got cut. He told me that Parcells was gonna call. He had to go to a meeting. Good luck, thanks for the contribution. I thanked him. He left, the phone rings, it's Parcells on the other end. And I go, hey Bill, how you doing? He goes, McConkie, those Packers drive a hard bargain. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, I had to throw in a couple clipboards with that blocking dummy to get you back. So, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to you know, grab him through the phone and you know, right. you wise guy. But I was ecstatic and it was like Christmas for me. I mean, it was one of the greatest feelings of my life, walking back into that locker room and, and, and being around the guys that I would eventually win a Super Bowl with, who to this day are my brothers. Head coach Bill Parcells and the rest of the Giant players and coaches. When you think back um, to that 86 season, one of the iconic moments obviously is the win in San Francisco on the Monday night and the Mark Bavaro play. Complete to Bavaro, down to the 35, still on his feet to the 30, down to the 25, down to the 20. He's got four men on his back and gets down to the 17. When you think about that game, what are the first things that come to your mind? Being down 17 to nothing to Joe Montana, Bill Walsh, the great San Francisco 49ers in their building on a Monday night. I remember in the locker room thinking, you know, most teams, it's over for most teams. But there was a confidence in that team. We were so resilient. Um, we came out and said, we, we expected to win that game with all those odds against us. And we came out and the third quarter of that game may have been the best quarter of football that I've ever been associated with. Scored 21 points and just imposed our will on the 49ers. What about the game in Washington when you clinched the division? That game was, again, a microcosm of that 86 team. We imposed our will, our defense was ferocious, and even for me personally, catching a, a, a touchdown against Daryl Green to ice the game, you know, late in the game, was a great deal. Sims is back at the 25, looking for a target. He's going end zone! Touchdown! What a catch by Phil McConkey in the back corner! Double team! The winner of that game was going to win the division and get home field advantage uh, for the NFC throughout the playoffs. That's how important that game was. All right, so now the playoffs start. Do you feel that you guys can't be beat at this point? Yeah, we had a run there. We knew how we would respond in every scenario. So we get into the playoffs. First game, you know, it's here comes Joe Montana and Jerry Rice and Bill Walsh, the San Francisco 49ers. 
you know, we've got him at our place. And Jerry Rice takes a long pass. He's going in to score, and somehow the ball pops loose. And, you know, I've got some friends and on there. They say, well, it could have changed the outcome of the game. I go, yeah, it would have been 49 to 10 instead of 49 to 3 because we were not going to lose that game. Uh, that was just, you know, a steamroller of a game. We were on top of our game as well as I've ever seen it. Then, obviously, the NFC Championship game. It's windy and fielding windy? punts on that day. Windy? <laughs> there were gusts 60, 70 miles an hour, I believe. It was extremely windy. If you go back and look at some of the tape and the confetti flying around, and it was really bad. We won the toss, elected to kick off, three and out for them, and they punted a lot. McConkey standing back at his own 10-yard line, the giant 10. Now, one of the, the, the mantras of a Bill Parcells and a Bill Belichick on punt returns, you don't let that ball hit the ground. Uh, it was against the law for me to let the ball hit the ground, so I knew I had to catch everything, um, and I was able to. Here's Cox's punt. McConkey's going to handle it. does. McConkey gets outside the 30. And, and I just can remember the howling winds. And I remember, I remember Carl Banks, who, you know, maybe he had the, an MVP season. He may have been the MVP of the league. And Lawrence, rightfully so, got, you know, so much acclaim. But Carl Banks was an absolute stud. And I just remember him play after play in that game, stoning running backs. Defense just swarmed him. Uh, Sims piercing the wind. Uh, Lionel comes back from injury. Lionel Manuel catching a touchdown. And Sean Landetta, I mean, their guy couldn't do anything punting into the wind. And, and Landetta was able to somehow pierce the wind. And that game, that experience, being in front of Giants fans who had been starving for a championship, at that point, I think it was 30 years, the electricity, the emotion in that stadium, winning an NFC championship here at Giants Stadium in front of our fans in a blustery, cold day was as good an experience as I've ever been around. When you win the championship, you know you're going to the Super Bowl. It's the greatest feeling in sports. Now you're in the Super Bowl against the Denver Broncos and uh, the towel waving. Yeah. Give me the origin of that because till this day, if a player waves a towel, Giant fans think of Phil McConkey. I had so much pent up energy in the locker room. So we get out to the tunnel area and I just couldn't wait till they said go. Now the NFC champions, the New York Giants. Sprint down the field. I started waving. I get to the far end of the stadium. They'd all stand up. So I used to have the towel on. And I started waving the towel. And it was bedlam. People would just start bringing towels. So it kind of progressed from just getting the butterflies out, sprinting down to the field to full-fledged get the towel out from the minute I went out and started whipping up the fans into a frenzy. We went into that game, and you know, one thing about Parcells, he wasn't afraid to, to mix it up. We went totally contra. We threw the ball when we should have been running it. We're throwing flea flickers. McConkey comes in motion to the right-hand side. Pitch, Morrister turns around, back to Sims, on the flea flicker. Sims is looking way downfield. He's got a receiver, complete, down to the 10, five. As you're running down that left sideline, and there's an end zone right there, oh. and you're saying, wow, three years ago I was in the Navy, yeah. and now I'm about to score a touchdown in the Super Bowl, and you, you, it's you had to be dream. sick. Well, it, 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 my dream, my whole life, of almost 30 years old, and you think about everything I'd ever dreamt of in, in my life up to that point was right there. Well, even just before I caught it, I can remember coming in motion across the formation from left to right, turning up field. And you talk about being fooled. Their secondary, their linebacking core, they were running around like chickens with their heads cut off. They had no clue. I came across and there was a big void and I remember the ball coming and I remember catching it and turning up field and just seeing green grass and white stripes and thinking, I am gonna score a touchdown in the Super Bowl Defense started to close on me, and I tried to hurdle him from the five-yard line, and he caught my legs, and I landed about a foot, foot and a half from the end zone, realized that I wasn't in, and it was the most frustrating feeling that I got that close to a Super Bowl touchdown. Hockey head over heels at about the one or two-yard line. A 
a gain of 44. And that's a celebration. Phil McCarthy wanted a Super Bowl touchdown. He said it's a great play. We're going to get the touchdown. I want it with to go down the record, but McCarthy scored a touchdown. The emotions that I had at that point, the joy, the thrill that we're going to win, and, but the frustration of getting that close to a Super Bowl touchdown um, was, was pretty frustrating at that point. I was also thrilled knowing that we were going to score the next play, and that was pretty much a decisive play of the game because we scored the next play. That game was, for all intents and purposes, over. One yard needed for a touchdown. And off Morris is going to get it. And the Giants increased their lead to 26 to 10. As fate would have it, in the fourth quarter, McConkie's dream would come true with a little help from his friend and giant teammate, Mark Bavaro. It is complete. Yes! He hung on to the ball. Bavaro hung on to the ball. McConkie came down with it. Off his fingertips. Bavaro to McConkie in the end zone. Well, as he likes to say, I helped him out because he dropped the ball. <laughs> right. Sims delivered it right between his hands. Ball's deflecting. It's tumbling end over end down and just snatched it you know a foot or so from the ground and again I, I was ecstatic I Super Bowl touchdown when I saw the ball bounce off my head and fall into uh, McConkie's hands he was all over it <laughs> exactly. you know? but he, he, wants he wanted it yeah, he wanted it thank God you know thank God he's like that because uh, he's so tenacious you know he caught it and I was probably happier than he was the Super Bowl champions are the Giants why do you think, I mean, your giant career wasn't very long. It was 84 through 88 with the stop in Green Bay. Why do you think you resonate with giant fans? Till this day, um, you're one of the names, and they talk about the 86 Giants. Your name comes to the front of people's minds. I think in this area, I think people really appreciate competitors. So I was a competitor, and that's how I got here. That's how I stayed here. That's how I contributed. And I think Giants, Giants fans, have always related to competitive, highly competitive people that would lay it all on the line to help their team win. And it didn't hurt that I probably had the best game of my pro career and the biggest game of my life. And you know those plays will resonate for Giants history. McConkie's NFL career ended in 1989. In his five seasons with New York, Phil would become one of the most beloved Giants of his era. And decades later, he still feels that strong bond to the Big Blue family. I go back to Wellington era. You know, Wellington said there's two kind of giants. You're either active or inactive. There was never retired or former or ex, which means to all of us that we're still part of this organization. It's 20 something years later. I feel like I'm part of the team uh, and that's special.